Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rancho Mirage City Council meeting for Tuesday, April 9, 2019. The council also serves as library and observatory board, the housing authority, and the city council representing the redevelopment successor agency. So I'd like to welcome you all here today. We're starting a little bit late. Appreciate your patience. So we'll begin with a flag salute, which will be led by our city clerk, Christy Ramos. Christy? Please stand. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Well, Christy, you did such a good job there. We'll let you do roll call. Thank you. Council Member Hobart? Here. Council Member Townsend? Here. Council Member Weil? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Smotrich? And Mayor Kite? Here. Thank you very much. And today we have the pleasure of having representation from the Palm Desert Charter Middle School. And would you guys like to come up and uh, come to the podium? And tell us why you're here. Um, good afternoon. Pull the mic down a little bit towards you. Yeah, that's good. Good afternoon. We are students from Palm Desert Charter Middle School, and we are here to say thank you to you guys for your continued support and donation to our annual eighth grade trip to the Museum of Tolerance in LA. We want to share with you our personal impact from the trip and then show you a short highlight film that encompasses our entire unit leading up to the trip, the trip itself, and the follow-up. My name is Haley Hayes, and I believe the Museum of Tolerance was an overall amazing and eye-opening experience, although it was very different from my initial expectations. I had anticipated the exhibit to be filled with pictures and other artifacts, as well as maybe a few videos to watch. I was very surprised to see how interactive it was and how much it further enhanced my knowledge. I enjoyed the many visuals throughout the museum and how realistic they each were. But they truly expressed how difficult it was for them during this time period and gave direct insight of what they went through. My name is Maya Morell, and I believe that the trip to the Museum of Tolerance gave me a realization of how difficult it was to live during this time period. Before we learned about it, I knew about the Holocaust, but hardly anything about it. Now that I have had the opportunity to go on this trip, I gained more knowledge about it. I enjoyed all the different interactive parts of the museum because it held my attention. The overall trip to the museum was sad, but very informative, and I am therefore grateful for the experience. <clears throat> Thank you again for your continued support and financial donation to make this experience possible for the entire eighth grade trip at Palm Desert Charter Middle School. Thank you, girls. Any questions? Thank you. You want to come back up? There might be some questions about your trip. Take the video. Pardon me? Review. How much time did you spend at the uh, museum? Um, the tour was like, Two hours? Yeah, it was like two or two. It was like two hours, hours yeah. and they took us through the different like rooms. You saw things you'd never seen before? No, it was like really cool. They had like all these different like stations and then they like played something and then it like followed to the next station and you kept going. Mm -hmm. What you might like take from that is <clears throat> that um, uh, on your spare time in school, um, do a little bit of studying, a little bit of research on the Holocaust era. It's uh, one of the most dramatic uh, periods of time in the history of the country and the history of the world. Yeah. Yeah, we did a lot of studying before about it. We read, like, different books about it before just to get, like, re or just a little knowledge before so it was easier to understand, like, when we went on the trip, too, which is cool. Yeah. Did you guys have a video that you'd like to show? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.
if you haven't uh, read the diary of Anne Frank, you would find it uh, fascinating, among other things, and it's about a young girl about your ages. Uh, you might give that a shot, and you'll get an idea of what what's behind the museum. Okay. One Mr. of the things, Go girls, you learn, and I'm sure you have been exposed to this, whether it, at the Tolerance Museum here and Rancho Mirage there, is as you're growing up and as you see things like this, when, there, when you see something wrong, speak up. Don't be afraid. You make your voice heard, and that's how you prevent these from, things from happening. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I would like to say that I'm so thrilled that you were able to attend and see what really happened because there are so many people now throughout the world who are saying it never happened, that those pictures were all made up and that there was never anything so horrific because people can't do that to each other. So now you have a new responsibility. You are the new storytellers. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much again for being here and, and doing the presentation with the video. It's very moving. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> okay, the next item on the agenda for today is the non-agenda public comments. And this is an opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda. And we would hope that you would uh, leave them at about three minutes per speaker. So uh, today, the first speaker I have is Brad Anderson. Brad? Thank you. Brad Anderson, Ranch Mirage, Ferber Drive. I wanted to mention a little, a uh, few items today. Uh, one of them, uh, uh, the city sponsored a studio tour of uh, local artists, uh, local artists, <laughs> is that correct? In in the city, and I think it's a great thing. Uh, but in the in the in the spear of things, uh, my neighbor actually runs an operation uh, right adjacent to me, right right next to me. Um, under the umbrella of an art type uh, business. And it's been going on for 10 years plus now. And, and, and of course, because of this, the foot traffic, the vehicle traffic, the noise, they have people working there all the time. Either way, um, I'm going to go ahead and accept it because it's been 10 years. And, uh, and uh, I, I just, I hate to see my neighborhood turn into kind of a circus type atmosphere. Uh, to promote this type of business, but it's going to happen. Matter, I I can't stop it. I've I've uh, complained about this a number of times, and I'm just going to have to accept it and move on from that. So, so uh, that being said, I noticed uh, the city, you know, the sponsor that uh, these people are a lot, and I noticed they have uh, flyers up in the city hall here, and I've asked about that, and apparently the city will sponsor. Uh, uh, people that uh, benefit the city or, or city-sponsored type things. But I think if you're going to sponsor this one one operation, you should probably sponsor all of them, too, and let them all uh, put the flyers up at City Horror. Uh, that, uh, that would be a good thing for everybody. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention uh, briefly about the Vector District again, uh, the Coachella Valley Mosquito Vector Control District. I've noticed they've been doing operations, uh, area operations down in the Mecca area. Uh, North Shore area, and, and and there's no transparency there. Uh, there's no uh, notification on the website, and uh, my research shows only three signs in the area that I've noticed, and they were all in Spanish. And uh, three signs, three signs for that type of area or application, and I would take that up with the commissioner too. I know that they'll really affect the city, and I'm going to go ahead and submit a letter to uh, correct the minutes. Uh, I think this would be an ongoing thing, but. Uh, from one of the meetings. <laughs> it's kind of the thing I do now. Uh, uh, it doesn't really pertain to me, but it pertains to another speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who would like to uh, speak on the non-agenda item? 
Okay. Oh. Could you give your name and address, please? Kerry Gherkin, uh, and I'm, I'm on Highway 111 at the corner of Country Club right there, 70390. The reason for my visit today was twofold. Number one, I've, I know that the city traffic has worked pretty closely to try and resolve a couple issues right around that area. One of them that's confusing to me is um, as you come to Country Club and stop to make a right-hand turn to the, towards Palm Springs, there's a big, two signs there, they're not that big, but there's two signs at about 10 feet up in the air that say no turn on red. We've all experienced probably that intersection as being a very scary, for some reason people blow that light all the time. And I see it because I'm looking right out my window at it and it's happened now in front of my eyes more than I care to say. So my concern was, and I spoke with staff and they were really helpful, was to get those signs that say no turn on red brought down to eye level where you can see them. There's one across at Thunderbird Villas. It's up at 15 feet in the air, 10 feet, I'm not sure the exact. And then also the one right there where you stop, if you look up through your visor, you cannot see it. You physically cannot see it. And those people are turning right on the red and we had a traffic uh, adjustment there yesterday and there was people going into a single lane of 111 and it was messy. So thus prompted my stop by today for that's the first item. The second item is I've lived in Thunderbird for a long, long time, and our gate at the end of Morningside Drive, which I know you've heard about, is a mess. We've fixed it four times in the last 24 months, and that's not counting the wall around it. People, for some reason, just miss that stop sign. Staff indicated that flashing lights often can cause people to deter, like we had just had happen out in, in Moreno Valley, but, um, I don't know what it is, but my sense of it would be after living there 20 years or so, rumble strips on this end, and then the, you, you've changed the traffic pattern there from a three-lane stop for some reason to a two-lane, which certainly makes sense, but I believe that center meridian area should also be bots dotted all the way through. I mean, at least they'd put their brakes on at least 20 feet before they smash our gate down again. I mean, it's an ongoing expense, and I'm, call, I'm showing up here as just an individual and a club member, and this is not from the country club, but I know that, that we've had a death there now from a very young man. Um, it's still ongoing. Apparently, traffic's looking at it, and it's my job to make sure that traffic was real hard at it. We've got a summer coming into. Our traffic will be subsiding. I think it would be a great time to get that adjustment made so that people know to stop at that intersection and also drop those signs or make them bigger. I don't care. I don't know how you deal with the state, but that would be my concern. The last item I have on my agenda, I spent almost 10 years um, at the Cathedral City Boys and Girls Club. And I want to thank you guys. I mean, I'm going to get a little percleft, but um, number one, uh, the computers, the van, the stuff you've done for that little tiny club out in the valley. And then um, Sunday, Charlie got the, uh, sorry, Council Member Charles Townsend got a um, award for Champion of the Youth Award uh, from the Boys and Girls Club. So um, my second hat is to thank you all for your support for our little tiny hubble over there. Yeah. And, um, and certain people have really stood out for us. And I just, again, I'm here to thank you. Thank you. And I really enjoy the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, it's one of my passions. I'm sorry I missed being there for my wonderful presentation. But I was under the weather. But uh, I hope to pick it up soon from you guys. We could even deliver. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Wait, before, before you run, just one question. Uh, the right turn you're talking about is on Country Club turning right at 111? Correct. Correct. Uh, and if you pull up there, the, the signs are virtually invisible. You're the cars are making the right turn. Possibly. The despite. motor officer could sit there on a motorcycle and make money all day long. I mean, thousands of dollars all what day do you long. Think, what do you think a sign that said, your stop is being videoed, uh, would do something like that. Two or three words that said, we're taking, we're... I don't think they see it. I really don't think they see it. I mean, I've seen our little Ranch Mirage PD sit over in our bank building over there in the canopy, and, and I mean, they're, they're, just, they're just plucking chickens. I mean, yeah, I, all day long. I concur with you. Uh, I've been at that stop sign, uh, second in line, and the car in front of me generally always makes a right turn through the red. Or they honk it from behind you to go. Yeah. Against the red light. But my thinking is I'm kind of frugal. 
I think if the, both those signs were to be dropped or a larger sign, and literally think about where you're at at eye level on that, uh, whatever that thing for the crosswalk is. If you brought it down pretty close to that, I don't know how it works with all the traffic patterns, but you'd see it. I just don't think people see it as my perception. Yeah, I think the eye level would make a big difference. Well, if you look at the angle, you can't see it if your visor's down. You can't see those Yeah, signs. I agree yeah. with that. Thank you again for your attention, Charlie. Thank, thank you. Thank you. You want to say anything on that? Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, on those two issues, uh, Jesse is looking at uh, the signage for the no right turn onto 111. And then uh, Morningside and Country Club, uh, there have been numerous accidents uh, where people are blowing that stop sign. Uh, the vast majority of them are DUI drivers. Um, and so we did one round of traffic control measures. We've still had accidents. Uh, so we are working with our traffic safety committee to uh, figure out a way to alert drivers that there's a stop coming. Um, we work closely with the HOA and we know it is a burden for them. So Jesse, I don't know if you have any other updates uh, that you'd like to share now, but it is definitely an issue that uh, we are on. <laughs> Yeah, Kerry, that's a good point. Uh, Morningside and Country Club, uh, we've actually had our, like Isaiah mentioned, we've had a second round of uh, improvements that we've drafted. We've taken them through the Traffic Safety Subcommittee. They've approved them. We've kicked them off to an independent traffic engineer who's approved them, and they're out to bid right now. So those improvements on that street will be coming shortly. Um, uh, some of the accidents, I, I think no matter what we put up there, um, you know, it's not going to stop every accident, but we're doing what we can. Uh, we're going above the standards at that intersection to uh, eliminate as many as many accidents as possible. But uh, you should see something out there shortly. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, is there anybody else who would like to speak on an item that's not on the agenda for today? Okay, we'll now move on to city council and board member comments. And we'll begin with uh, Councilman Townsend. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. And I will say that last month, the city of Palm Springs hosted the 2019 Senior Inspiration Awards, honoring the achievements of each city's seniors. And the event was held in Palm Springs at the Convention Center. We had over 580 people in attendance for lunch and the award program. Jenny Fote was chairperson and I had the honor to co-chair with her. We all at times say, time and time again, we get swept up in our everyday routines and simply run out of time to make a daily impact on our communities. Thankfully, there are many people out there ready and willing to make that impact and inspire us to do the same. For 27 years, the County of Riverside and the Coachella Valley's nine cities have honored their seniors, citizens, 65 years of age, older, or should I say younger, for their devotion and contributions to improving the lives of others in their communities. The Senior Inspiration Award highlights these role models and encourages others who are reaching their senior years to maintain active lifestyles and to participate in community efforts. This year, Rancho Mirage's Senior Inspiration honoree is Claudia Fossett. Claudia found her passion for volunteer work and especially for emergency preparedness back in 1994, after she was experiencing the Northridge earthquake. This was the catalyst for Claudine's involvement in emergency preparedness. Claudia has been very active in various emergency preparedness organizations. She spent three years on the city of Rancho Mirage's Emergency Preparedness Commission, and she currently shares and chairs the Mission Hills Community Task Force. She takes great satisfaction working a program she helped develop and implement. Congratulations, Claudia, and thank you for your dedicated 
volunteerism. It is truly an honor to be a part of that event that recognizes such wonderful, selfish individuals. Also, I'm pleased to announce that Rancho Mirage will be hosting next year's 2020 Senior Inspiration Awards. We'll be holding that at the Omni Hotel. I will have the honor to be the chairman of this event representing the wonderful city of Rancho Mirage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Charlie. That was very inspirational. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Several times I said it. <laughs> Dana, do you have anything you'd like to comment on? Well, I thought I would mention the fact that before today's meeting began, uh, we held a, a two and a half hour study session uh, to discuss uh, with uh, a tremendously informed audience uh, the various issues arising uh, from the poisonous air and the con uh, what's going on in the Salton Sea. Uh, my hope is that we will have that on uh, Ranch Mirage uh, television uh, within the next uh, few days. But I certainly urge everybody uh, to watch it. Uh, you'll learn an awful lot about the problems of the Salton Sea. You'll learn about what some of the remedies are for uh, parts of the problems, and you'll find it uh, probably the most uh, thorough in-depth um, program you've seen in the Valley uh, on the subject of the Salton Sea and uh, the troubles that it has and the troubles that it makes for us. So I strongly recommend that you watch it when you get time. Uh, it'll be a program you can go back to. I'm sure it'll be on for a while. It takes about two and a half hours to watch it all, but um, it's really uh, informative, and you'll be glad you reviewed it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Iris, did you have anything today? Absolutely. Thank you. Last week, the Coachella Valley Disaster Preparedness Network featured excellent presentations from all three of our local hospitals talking about their plans for a major disaster. One of the key takeaways from the meeting was something we are all aware of, and that is that not enough people are trained to handle disaster first aid, including stop the bleeding, wound packing, tourniquet applications, basic first aid, and much, much more. As we all already know, in a disaster, emergency medical services will be overwhelmed and unable to respond to our typical 9-11 calls. Hospitals will be triaging and treating patients in their parking lots for those people who are even able to get to the parking lots. And as we have learned from the televising of recent disasters, we will be the first responders for our families and for our neighbors. So for those people who would like to be more prepared, there will be a free desert healthcare seminar given on Thursday, June 6th. It will be held from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock at the Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs, and a light meal will be served. So please take advantage of this opportunity to strengthen your skills, and perhaps someday you will be able to help someone's save someone's life. It's a hands-on seminar, and participants will see, receive a CPR training kit and a Stop the Bleed certification. All of this training is absolutely priceless, so please register today by calling 883-818-0783. This seminar is certain to fill up fast, so please don't wait to register. And on the screen now, I believe Paul will be putting up the uh, flyer. So if you have a pen in hand, uh, try to write down some of this information. It's going to be great. Uh, Thursday, June 6, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's going to be at the Desert Regional Medical Center in Palm Springs. And please call to reserve your place by calling 833-818-0783. Thank you so much, and hope to see you there. I'll be there. Thank you. Councilman Weil. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> the inaugural Rancher Mirage Amateur Golf Tournament was held on March 26th and 27th. 
The two-day tournament was held at Weston Mission Hills on the Pete Dye Resort Course and the, and the Gary Player Signature Course and was only open to amateur golf players with an established handicap. An outstanding 50 amateur golfers from throughout the Southern California area attended to compete against one another. There were five flights, including a men's, ladies, Sinatra, Martin, and overall net. It was an exciting tournament, and I want to congratulate all the flight winners and runners-up. This unique tournament is another demonstration of why Rancher Mirage is the place to be. That 92270 zip code is a cache. I look forward to attending this event for many years to come. I will say this, that the golf program at Ranch Mirage, open to, to residents, has approximately 1,000 members. And it appeals to people that don't necessarily want to belong to a golf club. They might want to belong to the club for so social purposes, or they're here six months a year. It provides a wonderful void. Fred Strook, uh, a member at uh, Mission Hills, headed up this program. And Fred did a great job uh, putting it together. And I want to congratulate him. I also want to mention ever so briefly that on Friday, the Braille Institute celebrated its 100th anniversary and 30-year anniversary in the fine city of Rancho Mirage. They had a wonderful outdoor party, and guests enjoyed a tour of the, cent the center. They have hundreds of free programs that serve 37,000 people of all ages with diminished vision in their seven centers and 300 community outreach locations across Southern California. I was not aware of this, but some of the services include workshops involving computers, horticulture, cooking, art, uh, and exercise balance. They also offer guidance for students and their families about dealing, and this is extremely important, about dealing with emotional issues that arise when someone is losing their sight. If someone is not able to travel, the center offers in-home visits. So it was really a memorable e uh, weekend. Uh, Rancho Mirage, of course, was extremely active with their a and golf tournament, which was highly successful, uh, and the Braille Institute we're all extremely proud of. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ted. A lot going on. Right. Just a reminder that this Friday, April 12th, the Rancho Mirage Chamber of Commerce will host the annual State of the City Luncheon at the Ritz-Carlton in Rancho Mirage. During the luncheon, I'll provide a summary of the, kitty, of the city's current financial standing, new development, and businesses, our cultural and community events, and public safety, and more. There still are a few seats available. And you, you can call Rancho Mirage Chamber to get tickets, and their number is 760-568-9351. Or you can go on to their website, www.RanchoMirageChamber.com. Hope to see you all there. Again, that's this Friday afternoon at April 12th. Okay, moving on with the calendar, we'll come to the minutes for the March 21st meeting. Can I have a motion, please, to I'll accept? I'll make the it? motion to accept. Please vote. You get my vote. Hold on one moment. Chris, there you have to start over. <clears throat> there you go. Got it. Okay. Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. Okay, the next item is the consent calendar, and the consent calendar will be introduced by Isaiah Hagerman, City Manager. Isaiah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. You have five items on your consent calendar for consideration. 
Item number one is to waive the full reading of all ordinances introduced or adopted pursuant to this agenda. Item number two is to adopt ordinance number 1148, zoning text amendment case number ZTA 19001, amending chapters 17.08 and 17.30 of the Ranch Mirage Municipal Code to comply with state law. Item number three is the second extension of completion date for parcel map 36913 uh, Magnesia Falls Plaza. This is the office uh, building complex behind the Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. They are halfway done. Uh, if approved, this would give them an extension of time to November 7th, 2019. Item number four is a receive and file report of the emergency work that was uh, completed by staff on Frank Sinatra Drive and Country Club Drive. I would like to uh, thank our public works staff uh, for their great work both immediately after uh, the flood and the work that they did to get it repaired. Um, under our emergency work ordinance, uh, they could have just gone out and had somebody do it right of way. Uh, however, since we still had our road open and we were just missing one lane, they slowed down a little bit. They um, drafted the plans in-house and they still went through a version of a bidding process uh, to help save the city some money during this emergency work. And the work uh, should be completed within a couple weeks. Thank you, Public Works. And item number five are demands, and we are here to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions on the consent calendar? Is there anybody in the audience that has a comment or a question on the consent calendar? Okay, seeing none, could I have a motion, please, to accept the consent calendar? Second. Please vote. Motion carries, five zero. Thank you. We'll now move on to item number six on the agenda, which is the observatory update by Aaron Espinoza, the library director, also director of the observatory. Can I get the PowerPoint up, please? <clears throat> Good afternoon, honorable mayor, city council, and city staff. On March 25th, 2018, with over a 1,000 folks in attendance, the city of Rancho Mirage opened the Coachella Valley's first observatory, a facility intended for public outreach. The grand opening attendance was an indicative of what was to come in regards to the excitement and interest of our residents and those in our surrounding communities. <clears throat> Today, we stand before you as a proud staff leading the direction of the Rancho Mirage Observatory. As the operations manager at the library during the planning, design, and construction of the observatory, I was very excited by the possibilities of our observatory was going to bring to the Coachella Valley and our surrounding communities. As many of you know, I like to plan for all scenarios. Well, let me tell you, I have been overwhelmed by the level of excitement and interest of the observatory. Before I continue to talk about the successes of our first year, I wanna take a moment to recognize you, our city council, and all of our amazing staff. It was with your vision and continued support to build a state-of-the-art observatory right next to our library and to expand the library's mission of lifelong learning. Our staff at the library and observatory get the opportunity to be part of as well as a face of the observatory to our residents. When many of our, what many of our residents and visitors do not see is the hard work that went into the planning, marketing, and the continued maintenance of our observatory. To our city manager and to those city staff sitting on the dais, please accept our many thanks for your continued support and all that you do and your staff does to make our observatory thrive and to be recognized as a, for the truly amazing asset it is to the city and to the Coachella Valley. We have received many calls and emails 
and had have had in person numerous conversations expressing gratitude for the vision it took to build the observatory. The Rancho Mirage Observatory is being recognized around the nation as one of the best new attractions. In addition to being named best tourist attraction in California by MSN.com, the observatory was a finalist for USA Today's best new attraction in the nation. The observatory has also received two awards from the American Public Works Association. First was the 2017-2018 Project of Merit in the creative and innovative category from the American or APWA's Coachella Valley branch. Second was the 2018 BEST award in the buildings category through the APWA's Southern California chapter. BEST stands for Building Excellence, Shaping Tomorrow. The list of organizations that have done stories or other media spots on the observatory keeps growing by the month. In addition to print media, the observatory was subject to the Chill Chaser program produced by the CVB. And coming up in July, the observatory will be part of the PBS program, Ancient Skies. The accolades from the media and from our community partners is quite welcomed. But it is our residents and attendees we love to hear from the most. The observatory was conceived and built with the intention of providing the community with a research grade facility, but free for public outreach. One program that we started with the generous support of the Anderson Children's Foundation is Connecting Children to the Stars. The program was created to bring students from the Coachella Valley to explore the library and observatory. To date, we have served over 750 children from seven different schools, with an additional thousand students expected to be served by the end of June. We are working with the three Valley School Districts, as well as private schools and homeschooled students to ensure every student gets the opportunity to come tour and learn about the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. The Connecting Children to the Stars attendance is but a portion of those that, who have attended observatory-related programs. From tours to the observatory, to film screenings, to stargazing parties, to our original lectures, our attendance has been astonishing. In the first year of operation, the Rancho Mirage Observatory total attendance has been 13,699. That is an average of 1,142 people attending each month. We are very pleased with our attendance at the observatory, but by no means do we intend to rest on our laurels. I will now call on Eric McLaughlin, our city's first, city, or first astronomer and person responsible for the operation and programming at the observatory to discuss several new items and programs we are working on. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, I want to make sure I take a moment to give a personal thank you to all of you uh, for a wonderful first year of the observatory and personally my first year working with the city. Eric, it's been... excuse me one second, Eric. Can we get him on screen? There we go. <laughs> But yes, uh, I want to again say thank you for a wonderful first year working here with the city. Uh, it has been uh, more than I could have imagined, and it has been a phenomenal journey working with this wonderful community and everyone who comes to the observatory. So uh, with that said, I want to talk about a few of the things that are actually uh, nice and noticeable uh, of what we're working on here. Uh, First, I want to start by highlighting a few new pieces of equipment we're working with right now. Uh, on the screen here, you can actually see on the left side of the screen, this is a very new system. We are in the process of upgrading the telescope's imaging system from a singular camera to a three camera system uh, using what is called a Perseus port. The advantage of this is that the normal camera we have on the observatory's uh, main telescope is a very, very sensitive camera that is intended for deep sky observing and actually uh, is not of optimal functionality for very, very bright things like the planets. These additional cameras will allow for not only uh, planetary imaging to uh, become top notch, but also lunar imaging as well. So we're very excited to ha have this additional system being put in place. 
Uh, also on the screen there in the upper right hand corner, that is our solar telescope. Uh, it is an H alpha telescope. I know a number of you have had a chance to see it. Uh, it is a wonderful instrument that we are setting up on a nearly near daily basis. And if you look at the bottom portion of that camera or that telescope system, you can see there's a camera on it as well. Uh, what we're op what we're working towards is near constant daily imaging of the sun with a special wavelength known as H alpha. It is a very red wavelength that shows unique features on the sun as opposed to what you can see in general visible light wavelengths. Uh, moreover, there's another little box up there in that lower right hand corner. That is a wonderful thing and it is actually our first uh, true scientific endeavor we are a part of. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it is our global fireball observatory camera, which was delivered to us by Dr. Peter Jeniskins of the SETI Institute with uh, working with NASA funding. So I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So how are we using some of these things? Well. Really, when we're talking about our programming, we have a lot of different ways we use things. These images here are just a sample of some of the images we put up during our stargazing events. These are what we have showing in the main dome when people are coming in. They not only uh, have to, they, they, they don't just have to listen for uh, what it is we're talking about. Uh, if they uh, uh, happen to, I don't have to literally say the name of an object 10 different times. It's on the screen if they need it, but I'll be able to talk in detail beyond these little general surface features uh, about these objects. And also this gives them an idea of what to look for when they look through the telescope. So this is just a small sample of a number of the things we've been imaging and showing people during our stargazing events. <clears throat> All right, so back to the Global Fireball Observatory camera. This, this set of images was from a couple of days ago, or rather a couple of nights ago. Uh, these are images of the first bright meteor detection by the uh, Global Fireball Observatory camera. You can actually see in that image on the right that it actually, or sorry, on the left, uh, that it actually is currently set up in the middle of our deck. We're working with, uh, uh, with, the, with Public Works to actually find a good uh, permanent mounting position for it. But nonetheless, it's already producing good science as the, these images show. These, these meteors, what the intent of this uh, system is, is to detect these meteors, but not only just say, oh, we saw a meteor, great. No, the intent is to actually view these meteors from multiple sites. The reason why Dr. Jeniskins reached out to us is because we were in a good position to actually uh, complete a network throughout Southern California, which includes uh, other camera sites in uh, Beverly Hills and El Cajon down near San Diego. Having multiple camera sites means we can view objects like these from multiple perspectives and thereby triangulate not only where these objects might have come from in the solar system, but also where actual meteorites might have landed on the surface. By be being able to triangulate both those things, we could track down some of those meteorites, figure out what kind of rocks, therefore, come from where in the solar system. So this is a, a, a very nice, uh, true scientific endeavor that the observatory is just now uh, starting up. And with this first detection, we might actually uh, very quickly start having some scientific results, hopefully. <clears throat> Now, going back to our solar telescope, it provides a number of different views. And while this is a, a, a video here, before it plays, I want to point out some things. This is, again, a video format, and as such, it doesn't quite show all the nice little details that we can see. But it was fun to show this particular video because this is a video of what sunset looks like through our solar telescope. And I'll go ahead and start it now. You can actually see as it passes through the uh, through uh, the field of view, the mountains uh, near the observatory actually block out our view from the sun. Notably, you might say, oh, those mountains looked a little fuzzy. There's a good reason for that. We're looking through a telescope and those mountains are nearby. I am very excited for when we are actually going to see sunsets setting closer towards Mount San Jacinto. That will be further out so that blurriness you're seeing is actually a depth of field thing here. As the horizon on which the sun sets moves back towards summer uh, areas from our perspective, I'm anticipating clearer horizons and 
I am still very hopeful, though, that on occasion, maybe since that area is in the reserve, maybe some point we'll get a nice bighorn sheep right in the image as the uh, sun's setting <laughs> behind it. So it's a wonderful piece of equipment, and we've had a lot of great responses from people, uh, and it's one system that hopefully will get set up to actually have live images showing up inside the observatory throughout the day. So that is one thing we're really working towards, and we've made a lot of great progress on thus far. All right. There we are. All right, so uh, finally, one big thing uh, we're ready to actually note on is that uh, you, a number of you have already seen this system, but we're in the uh, process now of setting up a, uh, a more finalizing the scope of services with our contractor and uh, people we're working with for our projection mapping system. The projection mapping system uh, We'll go ahead and start that up. A number of you, of course, already got a chance to see this. This is something that will allow us to use the observatory in a wonderful new way, a way of actually being able to have people in the room during the day still able to learn more than just what can be shown on a little screen or of the telescope. This will allow us to explore the universe with people throughout the day, and this is something we want to work into other programs. We've already talked about the Connecting Children to the Stars program. This, uh, when it's set up in its final form, would be something that could be potentially integrated directly into that. <clears throat> All right, and I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back over to Aaron here. All right. uh, so as you can see, we've had a very successful year, in, in, uh, first year of operation, but there's much more to come as we develop as a staff and as, a, as an observatory. In the upcoming weeks, we will be adding an observatory coordinator to give Eric and our staff a much needed hand. Throughout the first year and into the future, we will continue to work on our mission, harvest starlight and convert it to knowledge. We wanna thank you for the opportunity to give the presentation and are available for any comments or questions. Thank you. Aaron and Eric, outstanding job. You guys are making that center phenomenal. That is a real high class uh, training center in a sense for for culture and both of you just have done a great job Eric you just got to get a little more excited about your job <laughs> <laughs> Eric but you, let me let me just tell you Richard I'm sorry did I cut you off go ahead. I remember when Dana and I were interviewing you and I'm speaking for Dana and after your interview your hands were shaking but you did such a wonderful job and to see you stand here and what you have accomplished as the first observatory is person running that and including your new star, your new wife also came to you through this, right? So congratulations to you with that, really. Okay, thanks again. Okay. We appreciate you coming out today. Oh, Mr. I'm Mayor, sorry. I just I also wanted to make a comment because you mentioned about uh, Eric's enthusiasm, and I have to tell people that if you think that this is uh, not out of character for Eric, it is not. When you go to the stargazing events, he is just as enthused and he is just as charismatic. The children love him, the adults love him, and we're so proud that he is a part of, of uh, an observatory that we are so par proud of. And I don't think we ever anticipated the kind of turnout or, or excitement that this observatory would generate. And for the people who don't have an observatory in their own towns, and uh, even the people who live in LA who, who can't always see the stars because of all the ambient lighting, they come here on vacation, they come here to visit, and this is such a breath of fresh air for them to be able to see what's up in the sky and uh, to appreciate the kind of um, viewing that we have and we offer in our observatory and the enthusiasm that goes along with it. So thank you so much, and thank you, Aaron. Uh, you're remarkable as a uh, leader at the helm, and we're so thankful to have both of you. Thank you, Ars. And <laughs> big hand to both you guys. Okay, we'll now move on to the next item on the agenda, and that's under public hearings. And this is item number seven, which is in the environmental assessment case number EA. 180005, and this is J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, south side of Highway 111 at the signalized intersection 
of Highway 111 and Bob Hope Drive, and it's going to be presented by Joy Sai, Assistant Planner. Thank you, and good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. The following request is an entitlement package consisting of a preliminary development plan and sign program for a single-story bank building, a drive-up ATM, and associated landscaping. So the project site measures 1.15 acres in size and is located at the signalized intersection of Highway 111 and Bob Hope Drive. Adjacent land uses consist of office and commercial uses, such as the Desert Pearl building to the east and the river across Highway 111 to the north. The proposed project is an infill project with all utilities available to the site. The subject property is zoned general commercial and is a part of District 2 in the Highway 111 East specific plan. The project complies with the requirements of that specific plan and the building is set back approximately 25 feet from the property line and is oriented along Highway 111 with the parking lot to its south, which effect effectively screens the parking area from travelers, travelers on Highway 111. There is a signalized intersection at Bob Hope Drive and Highway 111, which provides vehicular access to the mid-block alley, which also serves the project site and other properties in the vicinity. There is no direct access to the project site from Highway 111. As you can see on this slide, uh, the blue arrows indicate a two-way and the red arrows indicate a one-way. The overall height of the building is approximately 23 feet, which is under the maximum permitted height of 35 feet. The building has been designed to allow for mechanical equipment on the roof to be screened. The north and east elevations include an overhang, which will provide additional opportunities for shade. An attached carport is located at the south elevation and provides shade for 11 parking spaces, two of which are handicapped. The building has been designed in a contemporary style in desert tones with an elevated level of architecture. The use of composite wood panels, metal composite panels, and stone veneer provide additional interest and texture to the building. Mm. The applicant is also proposing a drive-up ATM sheltered by a 10-foot-tall canopy in a protected landscape aisle in the parking lot. This will be screened from travelers on Highway 111 by the building. The landscape palette for the proposed project features desert-appropriate trees and shrubs and complies with the city's landscape standards. Additional palms are added at the corner of Bob Hope Drive and Highway 111 to complement the existing palms across Highway 111 at Union Bank. The applicant has also submitted a sign program to establish sign design guidelines for the proposed project. The signs have been designed to reflect the architectural styling of the building and incorporate colors from the project palette. Staff believes that the proposed sign program is in line with the municipal code and is appropriate based on existing signs in the project's vicinity. Staff has received written approval from the Rancho Mirage Community Association endorsing the proposed project. Staff has not received any outside correspondence or comments regarding the request, and staff recommends that the City Council approve the filing of a categorical exemption of environmental impact pursuant to CEQUEST Section 15332 infill development projects based on environmental assessment case number EA18005005, sorry, and approve preliminary development plan case number PDP18005 subject to the content findings and conditions in the staff report and approve signed program case number SIPR 18002, 
subject to the content findings and conditions in the staff report. This concludes my presentation and I would be happy to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. Excellent uh, report. Uh, can you uh, tell us whether the uh, developer considered putting solar on the top of the building? Uh, with this application, um, I'm, they did not um, submit anything, any plans regarding to solar. Okay. And Mr. Mayor, if I may, um, there was a condition of approval that required the building be pre-wired for solar. So if they choose to add it in the future, it's already set up for that. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments, questions? <coughs> Question, hey. Dana, yes. Um, does the um, applicant have the authority to change the business that goes in there that we're now referring to as Chase Bank? In other words, if they decided they wanted somebody else other than the bank and they wanted to put in something that the city might find uh, less desirable or unattractive, <clears throat> do they have the authority to make such a change without our permission? Uh, they don't have the authority to make that change without our permission. Um, if they wanted to introduce a new use to that site, they would have to go through us first. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Open the public hearing. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to uh, ask a question regarding this item? Have any comments? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. My name is John Linskog. I'm the Vice President, uh, Market Director for Real Estate for J.P. Morgan Chase, here in support of the project. Uh, one of the issues I think was raised was uh, a question of highest and best use for the property, and it occurred to me that perhaps we should uh, provide a little bit of informative session here about what exactly Chase Bank does do for the community. And they do quite a bit. I've been with them 10 years, born and raised in California. I'm a former camper from the Salton Sea, by the way, back <laughs> in the days. Um, I know the area well. And uh, J.P. Morgan Chase impresses me over the last 10 years, the most inclusive corporation I've ever seen in the mod modern American culture. And uh, the company's been around a long time, since about 1799. It's a big history with, a, with America. In fact, um, before we finish here, I'll hand each and every one of you a book on the history of J.P. Morgan Chase. It's pretty fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, the culture for our corporation starts from the top down. Our leader, Jamie Dimon, our, our, our chief executive, uh, is very clear about treating each other right, uh, treating the community right, the customers correctly. Uh, when something is done and we haven't done it correctly, own up to it and get it fixed. And this isn't just for media consumption. We get emails daily on this, multiple emails daily on community outreach and things that were resolved and things that occur. Uh, we have with us today uh, Tina West, our market director, who can give you some better ideas on what we do for the community. But one of the things that... Uh, uh, J.P. Morgan is known for is the history behind it, over 1,200 predecessor, pre predecessor corporations. And um, it's interesting that uh, back in the 1804, you guys might remember the commercial on TV with the, uh, the guy eating the peanut butter was going to answer the question about Aaron Burr being involved in that duel way back in the day with Hamilton, and he couldn't get the words out because he was eating the peanut butter. Well, it's interesting that J.P. Morgan Chase today has those dueling pistols. And uh, it came about, that's one of our predecessor corporations, between Hamilton and Burr, they were involved in a, a charter for a water company back in the day to provide water for New York City. And uh, there was a clause in the charter that allowed any excess funds to go to create a bank. And Hamilton didn't like that. And in 1804, they, they settled that dispute. Unfortunately, Hamilton uh, was on the wrong end of that one. But uh, the family who owned it, was his, uh, it was his uh, brother-in-law who owned those pistols, and they sold them over to uh, uh, Hanover Trust, I think it was, back in the 1930s. But uh, the history goes way back, 1,200 predecessor corporations. We, uh, the proof that we do well as a, a corporation is, uh, based, is clearly evident by the fact that when we go into a trade area, we're the new kids on the block. You know, we just came out when the uh, last economic disruption back in, what, 2008, 2009 took over... Uh, WAMU, uh, home, uh, home Savings, and other banks. And uh, so we are the new kid on the block. And we come in there, and it's amazing to see over the years how deposits have shifted. And, uh, Chase has done very well in just about every area we entered. So on that note, I want to introduce you to Tina West, our market director. And uh, she'll give you some information on what else we do for the community. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Mayor, Council members. Um, I have some market facts here that I'd like to share with you on our corporate responsibility, um, some of our initiatives that we have done in the community. Um, these facts that I'm about to share are for Riverside County, and then I will also share what we're doing here at a local level for the Coachella Valley. So one of our initiatives is investing in skills. We have a global uh, workforce readiness initiative that um, we work with employers to help develop talent pipelines needed to compete and provide um, adults and young children with critical support, education, and training to build in-demand skills that set, set them aside on stable and rewarding career paths. Um, for Riverside County, under this initiative, we've donated approximately 100,000 to local nonprofits um, to support the workforce readiness program. We also are boosting small business and through our Small Business Forward initiative, we've made a 75 million commitment over three years to support under, underserved small business owners by connecting them to critical resources that help them grow faster, create jobs, and strengthen local communities. For the County of Riverside, we have donated and contributed 48,000 to local nonprofits in support of the Business De Development Initiative. Um, we also are, are, um, have an initiative with Pro Neighborhoods, which is a $125 million five-year commitment, and working to identify and support solutions for creating economic opportunity in disadvantaged neighborhoods around the country. Locally, in the County of Riverside, we've given 65000 to those nonprofits. One thing that's near and dear to my heart is the volunteerism. Um, J.P. Morgan Chase actively seeks to use the most important asset we have, which is our people and our employees. Um, we're very um, supportive of giving back to the community in forms of financial literacy um, and, and giving our time to our local nonprofits. Uh, we specifically partner with Find Food Bank here in the Coachella Valley, in addition with Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, only in, not only in the support of volunteerism, but also financial support as well. We provide financial literacy to all the residents at Coachella Valley Re Rescue Mission to help support them re-enter the workforce, re-enter, um, you know, find low um, affordable housing, and most importantly, set them up to be financially responsible um, so they can succeed. We also partner with United Way of the Desert and um, uh, many other local nonprofits, inc including um, Junior Achievement as well, and that's here in the local community. We are actually attending an event and supporting the veterans and do a lot for our veterans at J.P. Morgan Chase. And I'm happy to say that we are participating in supporting Carry the Load, which is on May 9th, and I believe we start here <laughs> and meeting at the um, chamber. So hope that many of you can join us as well in supporting our veterans and first responders so thank you very good very good do you have a start date for the uh, building yet when this is approved do I'll know? defer back to John for yeah. that one. <laughs> an opening date. Huh? An opening date. and an opening date and where are where are the pistols they're on uh, they're part of our historical collection apparently okay. um, I'm not sure of the opening date. we have people here who can answer that question and it depends upon when permits are in hand uh, but we'd like to have the project approved, and uh, we're looking forward to getting it open. If you need that answer, we'll get uh, Ed Cook, I think, has that answer. He's here. He's our project manager. Yeah. Well, you, well, you picked a real good city to build this in, and we're very happy to have you. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon, members of the council and Mr. Mayor. Uh, our thought for construction is uh, about four months uh, we'll take to get through the permit process as you know we've worked through uh, the planning staff uh, architectural review board uh, as well as planning and uh, we expect after approval today to start drawings and be in for permit within uh, about three weeks very good congratulations and opening, uh, and opening uh, either late uh, 2019 or very early 2020. Very good. And remember with that, it goes a complimentary ribbon cutting with the Chamber of Commerce and the mayor. I think it's going to be Iris at that point. Right. Duly noted. There you go. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Is there any other questions that you have of us? Good. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to comment on this? Yes, would you like to come forward? Good afternoon. My name is Susan St. Louis. I love I live on Clancy Lane and I know some of you. Um, I am very admiring of the building it, that you're talking about putting up. It's lovely and it will fit the environment very well. And I th think it's impressive what Chase has done with their community outreach. Yeah. But I would really like to see them put solar on this building. There is absolutely no reason why any public building should be built now without solar in California. And I really hope that you'll consider it. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you. We'll close the public hearing. I have a question. And Dana? <clears throat> I wonder if you could speak to the issue of uh, solar. Uh, why not now? It's easier to do it now than it is to tear up a roof and do it later. Well, it's, it'll be pre-wired for that, apparently. Uh, I guess that's current code as well. But uh, we could take that back with a request. I'm sure it's always a budget item. I personally have solar, quite a bit of solar, actually. <laughs> so uh, that's something we could take back and ask. It wasn't included in the original business plan, but we could take a look at that, and I'll see what they can do. Thank what you. would happen if we conditioned it, approval conditioned on it becoming solar? Well, I, like I said, you, you, uh, if, that, if you have that option, and then we'll have to deal with it, and uh, we'll work towards getting that accomplished if, if that's required. Well, thank you. Council member, there, there are, have been some changes, uh, obviously, with our energy authority. We are uh, actively involved anytime Edison does something. And uh, unfortunately, the dynamics for a commercial customer to go solar uh, have just been hindered by Southern California Edison. Uh, so they have taken the peak pricing and they've thrown it into the time of day where solar is no longer generating. So it really threw an imbalance into um, solar and it being feasible for commercial customers. You know, one of the reasons that we started RMEA is we do offer a 100% renewable option uh, that they are obviously eligible to sign up for through our energy authority. Would you explain what it is that uh, in Southern California Edison has done or is doing that precludes us from conditioning the project for solar? Oh, no, nothing uh, prevents the council from adding a condition. Uh, I was just saying from a customer standpoint, uh, they're making it harder for customers financially to make that decision because of the changes in the rate structure. But it would still be more economical than the Edison rates would be, wouldn't it? RMEA would be, but again, you're, you're talking about the dynamics of solar. <clears throat> RMEA is something that they would uh, be eligible for. Yeah. yeah. So they don't, they don't have to go solar to um, get 100% renewable energy. We have that option through our energy authority as well. What would be the drawback of including that as a condition? Oh, I wasn't trying to speak to a potential uh, condition that the council would put on them. I was just giving you factual information that Southern California Edison has changed their rate schedule, and from a business decision, the financial implications no longer pencil out for commercial to go solar. I mean, Jamie Dimon wouldn't be able to say that we held guns up to you, or at least two. <laughs> but as you can see, this is... It's an important item <clears throat> on each building as it comes, and we try to address those kinds of issues. <clears throat> and uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't like the idea of throwing in uh, curveballs at the end of the uh, the end of the inning when we're <clears throat> on the same page. But on the other hand, <clears throat> I know that if we don't condition it, uh, it's going to happen. Uh, it's just the nature of life. And uh, maybe you could explain that to Mr. Diamond, uh, that because we had such faith in him in accomplishing difficult things. 
that accomplishing solar uh, energy for this building, for a bank, <clears throat> brand new building and a gorgeous building. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe, maybe the council won't do it, but I, I would, I'm going to make a motion that we condition it for so solar. I could just comment on that quickly. I, not knowing how it would be attached to the roof, I do the real estate into the transactions, but uh, we don't want to get involved and have to redesign, change the upper side of that building to hide panels, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and, and I am aware of the changing in the Edison bill. It, it impacted me, the way they calculate things, so it's not as favorable as it used to be, even for homeowners, the way that it's calculated now. But as far as conditioning it, uh, is other buildings uh, being conditioned in this fashion throughout the city? As, well, when you go through approvals, so we're somebody, willing to do what some, everybody else somebody does. Somebody has to be a leader. In the, <laughs> we have leader been the leader, chase. but but we I don't want to get and delay this project. We have to make structural changes to handle the loads, et cetera. Well, I'll tell you what, let's find things out like a that. Bit. What kind of uh, what kind of uh, additional uh, difficulty would this create for them? Uh, it's my understanding that there's some amount of parapet wall, and maybe the architect can speak to that, but it, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal to, to hide solar panels up on that roof. Um, I'll turn it over to the experts, but it, it's routinely done even on older buildings in our city. Good, after, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Craig Bloom. I'm the architect for Chase Bank. Um, reality of it is that adding solar to a building in this day and age is um, is pretty much a no big deal. Um, state code requires pretty much every building to be solar ready. California Green Building Code standards require that. Um, one of the things that does possibly, no, we have to look at um, sun angles and everything like that. So there may be, there may be something, but in the reality of it is solar is um, on a technical aspect becoming more and more commonplace. Of course, I don't want to spend my client's money and tell them, yeah, we can do it without any problem, but... Uh, um, yeah, we can do it without any problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, but anyway, j just to speak on that, um, most, or should I say, the California Code now requires every building to be solar ready, meaning that roofs are already loaded or designed to carry the loads of extra um, panels Areas on a roof have been designated on a roof to be laid out for a solar panel, meaning that there's no exhaust vents or plumbing vents or anything that come through the roof on those areas. Um, there's, it's already pre-wired. All the features and everything are in place to simply install a solar panel at any time in the future. Um, and so, I mean, for you to have a condition of approval to say a building to be solar ready um, is probably something that is left over from um, the city of Rancho Mirage being forward thinking, which is now something that the California Building Code actually requires. So for them to, for, but to actually install solar panels at this time um, is basically up to what the council uh, may condition. Well, let me ask you this: Sorry. Will this guy, would this throw you guys a loop for right now? No. Throw you off? No, not at all. I mean, it may it may be something that our project manager will have to go back to Chase Bank to get additional funding to yeah. and additional approvals. But on a technical aspect, as far as putting plans together, changing the building design. Um, it's there's nothing it's more a monetary issue at this time going back to um corporation to see if there's additional funds available to install that at this time so will it, will it set you i hate to throw throw you a, you know a curve at at this time but what you're saying what dana's saying is true i mean it would be a wonderful thing for you to do it now can you do it get it done uh as far as the budgeting goes most of these projects are very very tight on budgeting, so it would require us to go back to corporate, I'm sure, for additional funds. That takes about, with the business case and the actual timing and getting the pipeline for all the other cases, probably two months delay. Mm, there uh, won't be too special. much delay in starting your construction. Well, they say they'd have to design it and then price it out, because every, everything at Chase, every penny, it takes like eight signatures to get it done. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's what, you know how if much they would hand me the budget and I would go forward and get the approval. 
Do you know what Jamie Dimon's salary is? Uh, no, I don't <laughs> offhand. I know he does well. It's about $28 million a year, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I just can't see. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I may be the only one that has this feeling, and I'm sure you hope I am. <clears throat> but uh, I just, I mean, now is the time to do it, not later when it will cost you money to change out an old system and make it mesh with the new. But, uh, but that's kind of what we're saying is that if, if we're not conditioned to do it now and it's decided to be done later, it's not going to be a major increase or a major expense. It's just going to be the cost of the panels. We're not going to have to retrofit the building to install it. Everything's there going to be in place, is going to be in place. We're not going to have to re-roof. We're not going to redo, any, redo anything. It's just a matter of installing the solar panels. It's not, it won't be a, a burden in the future. Just think how important it is to the uh, earth, the atmosphere. Uh, if not chase, who? <laughs> but you guys have good intentions of doing it at some point because you're already retrofitting it for it. Well, we're active, we're active in other ways. I don't know if you heard of the Ice Bear program, but it's where they capture all the energy at a cheap value at night and they cool the building with it in the daytime. We have several of those going on in Southern California now experimentally, so they're always looking for that edge. But it would be helpful for us and others coming forward to have that right up front when we start the application process so we could budget it and know that it's there. And uh, I know the city's been forward looking on that subject. Perhaps. How about if we conditioned it to be installed no later than a year after opening? That would be helpful. That would be helpful. If that's going to be a condition, that would be helpful. It would give that us would be better than the other way you're saying. <clears throat> Rather, it would be better than conditioning it now in the original building of it. Right. That's fair. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Okay. Yeah, that, that would be helpful. Okay. That would be my motion. That's a good compromise. Yeah. Well. Jeremy, you have a question regarding the, the solar panels. Yes, sir. Would they be visible from uh, the other sides of the property? Typically on flat roof buildings like this, we like them to be screened and hidden below the parapets. And so um, we've seen on, on similar type buildings that they can, the high side of the panels will only be about 18 inches to 12 inches off the uh, roof deck. So the parapets should screen them adequately. You might see a glimpse of them uh, from the south, but it wouldn't be any different than what's out there now. Mr. Mayor, before um, there's a motion to condition this project to require solar panels, we need findings. So I would suggest that the findings include um, a reduction in greenhouse gases, that requiring solar panels on commercial establishments is, is consistent with our policy on saving energy. So <clears throat> well, my motion will include reference to the conditions just uh, iterated by uh, our city attorney. Uh, so, Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would uh, move approval subject to uh, the Chase Bank installing panel, uh, what do you call them, panel electricity? Solar, solar. solar, solar system. In one year. Uh, uh, within one year after the bank officially opens. Maybe do, we, do we want to get into a one-year situation because they're just going to be finishing their building ready to move in? And now we're going to ask them to do the, the well, solar. If I may, Mayor um, and Council Members, maybe make it so that it, it shall be installed within one year of issuance of a certificate of occupancy. Right. Okay. That's my motion. Yeah. Much better. <clears throat> okay, so there is a motion to approve the, um, the item. I will second that. With a modification. To the modification that Dana read in. Okay. And, and incorporating the comments of our city attorney with respect to the benefits of, and the impact. Any comments, questions from down here? No? Okay. We're good. We'll, motion, please vote. And motion carries 5-0. Oh. So it shows our resident the power of an individual in City Hall. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you guys are the front runners, too. So there you go. Well, we are very fortunate, I believe, to have J.P. Morgan Chase absolutely, as a absolutely. business in Rancho Mirage. And, yes. uh, I'm sure corporate-wise, they'll do what they can to support our activities. Yes, I'm you sure. Get a nice corner there, too, Bob Hope in 111. 
Okay, we'll now move on to the last item on the agenda for today. Resolution number 2019, next in order. Adjusting electric generation rate schedule for Rancho Mirage Energy Authority, RMEA, Community Aggregation Program, presented by Tiana Makamo, uh, Senior Analyst, Senior Management Analyst. Tiana, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. The item I'll be discussing today is a resolution approving adjusted electric generation rate schedules for Rancho Mirage Energy Authority, RMEA. As established by the City Council, the mission of RMEA is to provide savings to our customers and reinvest back into the community through energy efficient programs. Since launching in 2018, RMEA has stayed true in accomplishing these missions. First, providing savings to our customers, it was estimated after one year of operations, RMEA would save our community $1.4 million. From May to November 2018, RMEA has saved our community approximately $900,000. Now this is our savings after just seven months of service. I will be back here soon to give a full one year update. I can confidently say we are well on track to meeting that 1.4 million estimate. The second mission of RMEA is reinvesting back into the community in the form of new energy programs. This has been achieved through the launch of RMEA's residential solar rebate program. The program launched in July 2018, and we are the first and only in the Coachella Valley to offer this unique type of incentive for our residents. The program encourages solar power system installations and expansions with a $500 rebate per household. Since launching, the city has provided 140 rebates, resulting in $70,000 directly back to our residents. For RMEA to continue these miss missions, essential functions such as rate setting must be done. Bringing us to today's item, resolution approving adjusted electric rates, excuse me, resolution approving adjusted electric generation rate schedules. During 2018, Southern California Edison, SCE, set their generation rates at a level that did not reflect the current market price of energy. For this reason, SCE has had a 7% increase in the rate change, effective April 2019. For ease in customer understanding and cost comparisons, RMEA's rates are developed to mirror those of SCE while providing a 5% savings for the generation portion of a customer's electric bill. The rates as proposed offer a 5% discount off of SCE's rates and ensure sufficient revenue is collected to cover costs and maintain healthy reserves. Staff recommends adjusting RMEA rates to confirm the 5% savings provided to our customers. That concludes my presentation and I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Council, any questions or comments? I'd sure like to hear what uh, Isaiah, how he explains this and what What's going on with Edison and what's, what's behind the surface, if anything? Uh, specifically for solar? Hmm? Yeah. For solar? Yeah, on, on this, why, uh, so, why we're here doing this now. Oh, for the rates. Um, so as Edison changes the rate schedules, we have to change ours to keep the apples to apples comparison. Is this just a normal situation? Yeah. So uh, throughout the year, Edison will, will change their rates based on the dynamics of what they've done in the past, what the future cost of power looks like, various factors. And so as they change their rates, we have to mirror that change to uh, provide the 5% savings to our community. So essentially what this rate change does is it reassures the 5% uh, savings to, to our community on their uh, electrical rates. Uh, within these movements, you, you have larger pieces at play. So uh, state law sometimes requires uh, changes. Um, so at a state level, um, carbon-free energy, renewable energy is very important. Um, and part of the dynamics with rooftop solar is uh, specifically in California during certain periods of the year, so the winter and spring, uh, there's actually uh, too much energy on our grid because of all the solar in California. So during the day, there's an abundance of energy that we actually have to get off the grid uh, and ship to other states. Otherwise, we will damage uh, the California system. Uh, and then at night, when none of these systems are producing, that's when the natural gas generators start kicking on because uh, people need energy at night too. So to recognize uh, the situation that California is in of having too much solar, 
uh, during certain parts of the year uh, and too much energy on the grid that will damage the grid, uh, the, the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities, have been working with the PUC to say, hey, uh, really peak pricing is no longer in the day. Because we have so much energy, we actually have to get rid of it. So what they were able to successfully get through the PUC is a rate change uh, that specifically impacted commercial customers that have solar. Uh, and then in a few years, those same rules will uh, impact residential customers. And essentially what they did is they threw the peak pricing out of the middle of the day. So if you have a solar system, you invested probably thirty to $70,000 within that system. And the way that you recoup your money is by eliminating your electric bills. So as you put energy onto the grid, as your system generates electricity and puts that onto the grid, you get a credit of whatever the cost of that power would have been for you taking it off the grid. So by changing the peak pricing to when your system's no longer producing, the credits you're producing from your system are worth less. So it really hurt the dynamic for commercial customers to go solar because now they're you know, kicked out the repayment period on their systems much longer and in theory you'll never recover the cost of your solar system. So you know, I, I think the way that the state is moving is obviously there's a, a new law, I think it's 2020, any new construction and uh, after that is gonna be mandated rooftop solar. But the utilities are turning around and saying, all right, who's gonna pay for the grid? So if you're wiping out your whole bill, no one's actually paying for the poles and wires. And if you have solar, you use electricity because when your system is not producing enough electricity, you're pulling off the grid at demand. If it's a cloudy day and your system isn't producing, you're pulling off the grid on demand. If it's at night and your system is not producing, you're pulling off the grid on demand. Yet the dynamics with solar is they eliminate all the money that goes towards the poles and wires. So it's kind of this weird situation where California wants green energy, but at the same time, they're allowing the utilities to make these rule changes that make it harder for people to go solar. You know, which is part of the reason through RMEA, we did the solar rebate program for residential customers, is, you know, uh, just something to help people that are interested in doing that for looking at CCAs and IOUs, the way everyone's going is uh, we're going to be the uh, procure the energy, uh, greener energy. So state law has already come out and said, hey, uh, we want to get to eventually 100% carbon-free energy. And so we have to provide uh, information to the PUC, uh, basically a roadmap, hey, from RMEA standpoint for our community, here's how we're going to uh, procure this carbon-free energy for our community. So one of the things we did, uh, the council did with RMEA is we're procuring a greener energy product. So our base plan that saves customers 5% on their generation rate uh, is also a greener energy product. And then we also created the 100% renewable plan. So for a little bit more above our, our base plan that saves you 5%, you can actually do 100% renewable energy without actually going solar. Uh, so that's for people in apartments or maybe people that don't want solar or can't have solar for whatever reason, yet they still want to make a positive impact on their community and do it locally. It's an easy way for somebody to sign up to get greener energy. Eventually, the whole state of California will get there. And entities like RMEA, uh, we are currently in the process of contracting out uh, for these carbon-free renewable resources, and that percentage will continue to grow over time. Uh, so as an example, one of the things that we're going to be discussing when we return in June uh, with the council is right now our base energy product that saves our customers 5% is 50% carbon-free. Um, so those thresholds uh, will most likely staff will be proposing to increase that base threshold somewhere between 60 and 70 percent carbon free for our base plan. And that's just in line with keeping with what the, the state goals are. I think for an individual customer uh, standpoint, um, you know, they have to weigh the dynamics of solar based on their specific case. Uh, and one of the issues that the solar industry is running into is right now every system is designed for that roof. 
versus you take something like um, Dell Webb as an example. They have four solar choices on many of their units, and that's a pre-worked out deal between the contractor and the solar provider. So you eliminate the ability of the homeowner to pick where the panels are gonna be, what, type, what company they wanna go with, and it's being forced upon them. So one of the consequences of the state mandating rooftop solar on new construction is you remove the ability for the consumer to pick the type of system they wanna have. Maybe they didn't want the panels uh, on the front of their house or on the side of their house, or maybe they would have done, a, done it a different way to screen them appropriately, or uh, you, know, you get into too many factors with these solar installations, and uh, you know, in the future, it'll kind of el eliminate the ability to tailor these systems to the specific customer, and it will a lot of times eliminate the customer's choice on the size of the system and how much of the bill it's gonna be netting out. So, you know, as, you, as we work through RMEA, obviously one of the benefits of the city council forming RMEA was, was definitely with the environment in mind. Of not only did we wanna provide cost savings because that's important, but we also really wanted to take um, a, a, a frontline approach on what type of energy product are we procuring for our community. And so as we continue to uh, work through time with RMEA, you will see naturally those percentages of carbon-free energy increase for our community. Obviously, we have to be conscious of price and availability, um, but many of these changes that you're seeing today are a result of kind of numerous uh, changes that are going on at the state level. And at the end of the day, what this action does is it reaffirms the 5% savings to our community on their generation rate, uh, and it aligns our rate schedules with Edison so that they still have that apples to apples comparison. So if uh, someone in the community, a resident or a business said, hey, how much is RMEA saving me if compared to the Edison rate, we can do that analysis for them. Versus if you, if you break away from the rate schedule of Edison, it becomes very convoluted of trying to communicate to our community what the benefits of our program are because now there's no longer that apples to apples. So Tiana, not me, well, can sit with the customer and say, oh, you know, on page five of your bill, the rate you see right there, if you were on Edison's rate plan, it would be this. You know, and so that's why it's important over time as, as Edison moves for us to get, keep that comparability so that we can properly communicate with our community. Got that. So essentially, <laughs> yeah, I do. I think that was a great explanation. So essentially, not essentially, actually, <clears throat> there will be no increase in the RMEA uh, households uh, as a consequence of this. Right. We're, we're reaffirming that 5% savings that they get. How, how is, uh, what is Edison doing? Is it increasing its rates by uh, some percentage? Yeah, so the in general, in, in uh, the energy world, uh, futures are going up. Cost of power is going up. So inherently, as uh, the cost of a product goes up, the cost for the service is going to go up. So Edison is increasing their rates. But even though they're increasing their rates, the customer will not see that increase. Isn't that right? The customer will always have a 5% savings. Correct. Is that 5% maybe less than it was Previously? No, the 5% the, the stays. So re, the 5% stays, but the value of the 5% is that the same as it was before the change is made? Um, or is it does the value of that go up or down? Yeah, so obviously uh, from a dollar perspective, you have to apply it to the individual customer. So if you get a very large customer, like take one of our resorts, they're gonna save from a dollar perspective, you know, over $40,000 in a year because they use a lot of electricity. And last year they would have saved how much? The same. Same, okay. You know, from a residential perspective, you don't use as much electricity as those big commercial properties. So from a dollar standpoint, that savings is less. But at the end of the day, no matter what rate structure you are or how much energy you're using, whatever that number is, you're saving 5% on the generation rate. Thank you. Tiana, the um, subscribers to the RMEA in Rancho Mirage, what, what percentage of those people opted out of the program? 
We still nearly have 100% of our community participating in RMEA. So the exact percentage is 99% of our community, Wow, which is wonderful. That's great. That's amazing. Amazing. Really good. Down here. I'm just saying it's an amazing program. And uh, again, all of the staff and, of course, Isaiah, who really spearheaded this and just, I think he breathed, sleep, and slept for 24-7 for I don't know how, two years. But you did great. And you will recall that we're the only city in the valley that offers this program. Yes, we are, and done well, too. Okay. Which, All right, so is there anybody? We'll open the public hearing. And if there's anybody who would like to speak on this item, come forward. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. I'll make a motion, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, that the City Council adopt resolution number 2019, next in order, adjusting electric generation rate schedule for Rancher Mirage Energy Authority Community Aggregation Program. Please vote. Councilmember Townsend, would you please enter your vote? Hey, vote before oh. talking. <laughs> me and my big mouth, see? Excuse me. And motion carries 5 0. Okay, thank you very much. And that's the last item on the agenda for today. We'll now move into closed session, introduced by Steve Quintanier, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The city council is now going to recess into closed session pursuant to government code section 54956.9 to discuss one potential case. Facts and circumstances that might result in litigation against the city are not yet known to the potential plaintiff, which is the reason why we don't. Um, describe why there's potential litigation. Council will also discuss the uh, pending cases of Veronica Juarez versus City of Rancho Mirage and new circular wireless DBA AT&T Mobility versus City of Rancho Mirage. Thanks, Steve. Meetings adjourned.